Welcome into Mac and Mose. Andy McNamara joined by the editor in chief of Godex.com, Rob Mosley. We are here to wrap up Oregon's game at Nebraska. It was a 35 to 32 defeat. Uh, the Cornhuskers over the Ducks in front of 90,000 plus the 350th consecutive sellout at Memorial Stadium. A great atmosphere and a great start for the Ducks, but in the end, there, there were just too many mistakes, uh, too many penalties, and you could really sort of point fingers in a bunch of different directions as to why Oregon wasn't able to get this one done. Yeah, you sort of had a confluence of events, you know, late, uh, late second half, you know, a special teams play. You know, they had a long punt return. Uh, that negated what would have been the 14th penalty on Oregon because uh, for cat, kick catch interference. Uh, Oregon's inability to convert a first down uh, late in the second half, and then a bunch of penalties on the last touchdown of the of the th second quarter, then the second touchdown of the third quarter, part of the, which was the capper in a 21-0 run for Nebraska that that really tilted the tide. Ducks fought their way back in. You know this wasn't. 2013 at Arizona or, or 2015 against Utah where things went completely sideways. They fought themselves back in and had a chance to win. But uh, in the end, for me, the X Factor is Tommy Armstrong, the Nebraska quarterback, made a couple more plays than Dakota Prukop made, which uh, I got to eat some crow. I, I would not have been my prediction uh, prior to the game. Yeah, I, I thought he, uh, we knew that he was athletic and, and was going to be an issue in the running game, but his ability to, to take some shots downfield. Uh, you know, he threw some some wild incompletions yeah. that were nowhere near receivers, but he also uh, made some really big throws, especially in the red zone. And then obviously he used uh, his legs on the, the final touchdown that was the capper. Oregon had a chance after that. Charles Nelson got behind the receivers uh, or behind the, uh, the secondary and was open uh, for what probably would have been a, a go-ahead touchdown, possibly a game-winning touchdown. But Dakota Prukup's uh, pass attempt came up a little bit short. And then on fourth down, the Ducks just couldn't get anything off. It was unlike Arizona State last year. You know, you, you had sort of a sense that, well, you know, they've done it before. Maybe they can do it again. It wasn't, uh, wasn't meant to be this time. Some positive takeaways. Uh, the Ducks, uh, and this isn't a positive. Royce Freeman only played two offensive series in this one. But once he went out of the game after uh, just a handful of carries, the, the rushing attack, the three-headed monster, if you will, of Tony Brooks, James, Kanai Benoit, and Taj Griffin were really impressive. And while Prukop had his, his struggles in the passing game, uh, we saw his legs on display as well in this one. Yeah, I, I think uh, we've seen before in, in you know garbage time, for lack of a better term, in, in, in previous games where Kanai Benoit, Tony Brooks, James, Taj Griffin spell Royce Freeman and the Ducks don't feel like they miss a beat. Um, but to do it on a stage like this against a level of competition like this was, was really encouraging, particularly as you know, Royce's status might be up in the air as, as we go forward at least for a couple weeks here. Um, yeah, you know, I think defensively you start five new guys. You know, they mostly held their own. I thought they got tired during that 21-0 run a little bit. Um, but I look at the offensive line too. I think you know, Tyrell Crosby only, only plays a part of the first quarter. Cameron Hunt pulled after a penalty in the second half. Um, I think if you told people going into the year that the Ducks would be playing in crunch time at Nebraska with, with Doug Brenner and four redshirt freshmen on the offensive line and had a chance to win, uh, I bet a lot of Oregon fans probably would have taken that and would have been sort of pleasantly surprised that, that, it was, that they were in the game and, and still giving it a shot. Those guys continue to develop, and that was invaluable experience, which they need to keep accruing and keep accruing as Pac-12 uh, play approaches. You, you mentioned it, the, the new starters defensively in this one, some of that just due to players being unavailable. But I think also we, we're starting to see uh, Brady Hoke and, and the Oregon defensive coaching staff starting to figure out, okay, which guys they, they like in, in certain situations. And we saw Tyree Robinson playing more corner again this week. Brendan Schooler gets his first career start. Khalil Oliver gets his first career start. Jonah Moy starts for Troy Dye and, and had, a, had a really productive game. And you know he was a guy that, that came to camp last year, JC transfer, and as soon as he got on the field, you know just his athleticism, you're like, wow, that guy, you know, he can be a dude. And and he showed, uh, you know, I, I was really impressed. You know, I hadn't seen a whole lot out of him in fall camp and then early in the season, but it seemed like uh, late against Virginia and then this entire game against Nebraska, he's starting to figure some things out. Yeah, and, you know, I, we certainly don't see the game the way coaches do and, you know, gap assignments and all that things. But I thought Jimmy Swain uh, got in on some plays and Johnny Reagan had a career day. Um, so, you know, when A.J. Hodgkins comes back, you know, it looks like there might be a pretty solid two deep there at linebacker that can rotate. Uh, I think the Tyree Robinson move to corner, you know, paid a lot of dividends because he's, he he may be better suited for that spot. And I think they really liked what they got out of Brendan Schooler and Khalil Oliver at safety, 
might have missed Schooler uh, more than we, we would have guessed in the second half uh, when, when he was out of the game. Defensive line still sorting some things out. Drayton Carlberg got a start. It uh, doesn't sound like that, you know, he made much of an impression one way or the other with coaches. Uh, but uh, playing without Jalen Jelks, um, you know, the Ducks played without their leading tackler coming in the game, Troy Dye. They played without their leading sack guy coming in the game, Jalen Jelks. They played without their leading rusher, Royce Freeman, for most of the game. And their best offensive lineman, Terrell Crosby, for most of the game. And it was a, uh, it was a competitive game right to the end. And again, that's the sort of thing where if you say going in, uh, that those would, that would be the case, you might be pleasantly surprised. But um, obviously, the penalties and the two-point situation—you um, know—you can argue about the, the, the whether to make that call till you're blue in the face. The bottom line is they feel like Charles Nelson in that role is an X factor that can steal points for Oregon, um, and, and that if they execute things well, that can be the sort of the edgy thing that Oregon does that nobody else does that, that sets them apart and gives them an edge. It just wasn't executed the way they wanted it to be. Yeah, 35 to 32, the Ducks go down in this one. Uh, 35 points allowed, but really the penalties, as you mentioned, also the ability, the inability of the of the offense in a couple of situations to prolong drives at all. You touched on it at the end of the second quarter. To me, that was really the turning point in the game. The Ducks get a great defensive stop. They get the ball back with a little over a minute to play, so they can either kill the clock and go into halftime up. Uh, at that point, it was 20 to seven. Or you know maybe they can get some points. Maybe they can move it into field goal range and and, and steal a, steal a couple more points before halftime. Instead, they only take 15 seconds off the clock. The punt was was not good, and then it was returned. Uh, it was I think it was a 40 yard punt, and then a 45 yard return sets up a short field for Nebraska. And then you know they were getting the second half kickoff, and so it, it just sort of you know it it, it was. Uh, I, I wouldn't pin it all on the defense when you look at those those points given up. You know, the, the 50 yard touchdown run by Taj Griffin, a couple of 40 plus yard runs by Kanai Benoit make the stats look really good for those running backs. But if there was one time I look back and say Royce Freeman would have been a real, real helpful, it was on that situation right there because that's a guy who can move the chains on a second and short, third and short, prolong a drive. Uh, uh, keep things rolling. They could have at least milked some clock and kept points off the board for Nebraska, if not drove, uh, drove the field and put some more points on for themselves. So, uh, yeah, that was the one time I said, yeah, Royce would have been nice to have. Fresh set of downs this week for Oregon. They go into conference play. It's all, uh, it's basically you start over. You're 0 0 in Pac 12. The Ducks finish 2 and 1 in the non conference portion of their season. Their one loss coming to a 3 0 Nebraska team that, uh, Oregon fans are going to be rooting for the rest of the way, uh, and and you know there's still certainly a lot a lot uh, to build on as they go into the Colorado week. Uh, that is a 2:30 kickoff on Pac-12 Networks. It's the Ducks and the Buffs, and Rob and I will be back later in the week to preview that. If you have any questions for us about uh, this past game or or what's coming up, how the Ducks are looking in practice, you can get to us on Twitter. I am at McNamara UO. He is at Duck Football. Until next time, we'll see you.